So in this closing uh, program, we have someone who's very dear to us here in Abilene, uh, an Abiliner himself. We have with us Rick Williamson, who served from 70 to 71 in the U.S. Air Force at Phuket Air Force Base. And in 2017, he was able to travel back to Vietnam. And what he would like to talk to you today about is what he learned uh, in his, in his re return trip. Thank you, Rick. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for the veterans in the crowd, at ease and smoking if you got them. That's, I think that was a boot camp flashback, maybe. Uh, when I was invited to speak today, I thought, wow, this is an opportunity that I can go and try, try on my old uniform that I was issued in Vietnam. So I uh, went downstairs in the box, marked old junk, pulled it out, tried it on, and the only thing that I could get on was my dog tags. <laughs> now in the interest of full disclosure, the name given to this presentation is Vietnam Then and Now. Actually, there's very little then and uh, quite a bit now. As I was in the Air Force, uh, on an Air Force base in Vietnam in hostile territory, so I never really got to get off. The only thing I saw of Vietnam was from the air. This presentation was not prepared for the finale of uh, the program on the Vietnam War, but rather a travelogue that I gave a presentation to Rotary and later to friends and family for the purpose of uh, sharing our thoughts and photos about Vietnam today. I'll begin. Uh, Sin Chao. That is a common greeting of Vietnam. We'll start off this program with a photo of a yellow chrysanthemum. This is the flower the Vietnamese people display to celebrate the Lunar New Year, which was the end of January and lasted for about four days. The flower is symbolic of a composed and unpretentious lifestyle and is also the wish for a harmonious and happy family. It is placed near the front door to welcome the New Year. I wondered, some 46 day, uh, years later, how things may have changed in their country. The answer is everything and nothing. Now they have KFC, ships full of tourists, about 10 million per year, and a modern 51-story building with a sky deck. But they still have the same rice planting machine, the same outboard motorless motor boat, and the same farm tractor. <laughs> this story actually begins August 1970. I was a 24-year-old sergeant at Collin Air Force Base in Sacramento and received orders for an all-expense trip to Vietnam and to report in October 1970. You can imagine how thrilled I was because I pre-enlisted in the Air Force before graduation from college so that I would avoid being sent to Vietnam. It's probably a familiar story. I spent a year at Phuket Air Force Base located in the central highlands of Vietnam, south of Da Nang, uh, between Pleiku and Quinh Nhan. As I said, I didn't see much of Vietnam as we were restricted to base because the Viet Cong were active in the area. This presentation is meant to be apolitical, but I must say that when I joined the Air Force, a 22-year-old hayseed from Raleigh, Kansas, I believe that our government and military leaders were not leaders astray, and our mission in Vietnam was just and victory achievable. After a few months in the middle of the fray, I began to have serious doubts why we were there in the first place. It turns out we didn't understand the will of the enemy nor how to fight in their backyard. 
have since read passages from a book titled uh, Bare Feet, Iron Will, written by James G. Zumwalt. He was the son of the Vice Admiral Elmo Zumwalt, who from 1968 to 1970 <coughs> commanded the naval forces in Vietnam and a brother of Elmo Zumwalt Jr., who was in the Navy and commanded a river swift boat in the Brownwater Navy. Tragically, the brother was exposed to Agent Orange and died of cancer in 1988. James Zumwalt went to Vietnam in 1994 to interview those who served in North Vietnam and Viet Cong forces for this book. In an interview with a general who was commander-in-chief of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, he said, in the war, the Americans drew strength from their vastly superior battlefield technology. The Vietnamese had to look elsewhere. They turned to their own rich history, one rooted in warfare going back a thousand years, as one invader after another violated their borders. Over the millennium, a spirit of nationalism and pride evolved, instilling within the Vietnamese people a determination to drive out all foreign invaders. The spirit of nationalism and pride and determination developed into their greatest strength, an iron will, which made accomplishing the impossible possible. In the end, it was the iron will that was able to defeat the technology of the world's greatest superpower. Photos of the uh, base uh, F-4 fighter jet, which was a primary aircraft that we supported. The revetments where they parked the F-4s. Next to our base was a Republican of Korea Army base, rock base. <laughs> the rocks were fierce fighters and feared by the Viet Cong. We had a certain amount of comfort knowing they were adjacent to the base. Every year, they would invite the troops from the air base over to their camp so they could show off the weapons they captured from the Viet Cong. I'm standing, I'm standing by an actual rocket they would shoot into our base. The good news was the weapon was crude and they could hardly shoot straight. The bad news was they couldn't shoot straight. Their primary target was the flight line, hoping to hit some F-4s. We who stayed in the barracks were always fearful of a wild shot. This is me, who would be a happy troop in 23 days and a wake up. In October 1971, when the Flying Tiger Airline jet lifted off the runway at Danang Air Force Base, all aboard let out an audible yippee me and a plane load of soldiers going home couldn't get Vietnam, out of Vietnam soon enough. My impression of the country was that it was a hell hole of the first degree and returning on my own dime was never a consideration. Fast forward to a few years ago, I talked to a friend who traveled to Vietnam, said it was a great trip. And after 46 years, my bad memories had mostly faded so I proposed the idea to my wife and our longtime friends and traveling companions, Ed and Barbara Osborne. They're right there. Lift up your hands. Uh, and we all decided that uh, we wanted to go. We traveled with Overseas Adventure Travel on a 19-day tour named Inside Vietnam. There were 16 travelers plus Henry, our trip leader. The map of Vietnam shows our stops from Hanoi to the north to Ho Chi Minh City to the south. Uh, we began our trip in Hanoi, were there a couple days, went to Heilong Bay, uh, were there on a junk overnight, went back to Hanoi, and then we flew to Hue, drove through Da Nang, to Hoi An, uh, back to Da Nang, and then to Nha Trang, which is further south. Then we took a bus ride over to Da Lot, and from there we flew to Ho Chi Minh City, and then took a 
trip to the Mekong Delta. So we, we saw most of Vietnam. If there's a theme to this talk, it is Vietnam, paradox, or enigma, more likely both. Vietnam is a country of 94 million people. It's a little over 1,000 miles long in length, and at the narrowest point, 31 miles wide. It's ruled by the Communist Party of some 4.5 million members. They call themselves the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, and the motto is, Independence, freedom, happiness. This is the first paradox. There is definitely no independence, few freedoms, but maybe some happiness, since they're not at war. Vietnam has been at war in the modern era, era from the mid-1940s with the French until 1975 when the U.S. troops pulled out and the communists took over. For the first 10 to 15 years after the war, the communists ruled the country with an iron fist. They believed, as most communists do, that the state knows best and ran everything, including the economy. They failed miserably in their experiment and in the mid-1980s adopted what is, in essence, capitalism, but they call it an open free market economy. They're trying to become something more than a third world country and barely succeeding. Nearly all the infrastructure is old and inadequate, especially in the north. We flew on Cathay Pacific Airlines from Los Angeles to Hong Kong, then to Hanoi. The trip took a total of 17 and a half hours of flight time, with a 15 hour time difference. We left Los Angeles 10:25 February 13th. Two days later, we land in Hanoi. After arrival in the morning and getting, going through trans, passport control and customs, we headed to our bus. It was time to say something I wanted to say for at least a couple of years, and that was, the gentleman this morning stole my thunder. Good morning, Vietnam. <laughs> uh, Robin Williams did it much better, but I enjoyed the moment. I bought a shirt when I was in uh, Hanoi, uh, to wear for the Rotary presentation, which read, Good Morning Vietnam. I tried it on just before the talk, discovered that an XL in Vietnam is about a medium over here. So all I could do is show it. Our bus trip from the airport to the hotel, about 45 minutes, was what I've described as a sensory overload. We started out seeing rice paddies. We entered the city proper and saw high-rise buildings. Traffic that belies description, motor scooters amok, cars, buses, smell of street side cooking, and incessant honking. My guess is that the first piece of equipment that wears out on anything in Vietnam is the horn. Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam is a city of 9 million people, 5.7 million motor scooters, and 660,000 cars. When we arrived at the hotel, we had lunch on our own. Our guide gave us directions to a restaurant, and walking there, we noticed the streets were narrow, hardly any place to park, so most of the parking of the scooters is on the sidewalks and in the buildings. Another thing I noticed was the size and shape of buildings in the city and throughout Vietnam. By government regulations, a single family residence is 15 foot by 45 to 60 feet long. Many of the structures are two story or three story and that is because other family members live upstairs and in approximately the same square feet. Telecommunications is another paradox. According to Henry, most everyone in Vietnam has a cell phone, a television, and a DVR. However, as you see, it is pretty much a cobbled up mess. It will take years, there are 
they're trying to do some uh, underground wiring and uh, put it underground, but like most things in Vietnam, it will take years for it to get done, much less done right. You might also notice the speaker on the pole, which was across the street from our hotel. Every morning at about 5.30, the citizens of Hanoi and most of Vietnam gets to hear the party message. This is Henry, our trip leader. He would tell us where we were going and information about the place. I quote a lot of facts and statistics that I learned from him. He's 39 years old, still single. He's a college graduate and majored in tourism. Henry showed us early on how to cross the street. With very few crosswalks and traffic lights, you're pretty much on your own. And since there is rarely a break in traffic, he said, raise your arm, walk slowly, do not run, do not stop. No one stops from you, but they always seem to keep from hitting you. <laughs> he also stressed, that's the truth. <laughs> he also stressed that while crossing the street, we should stick close to Henry like sticky rice. So we'd be crossing the street, and Henry would say, Sticky rice with Henry. <laughs> this was a cyclo rickshaw ride, which was pretty exciting, being in the middle of all the traffic. We went to the Ho Chi Minh Mausoleum. I must say that Uncle Ho looks pretty good for being dead since 1969. They've made him out to be the common man's hero and the savior of their country. As part of the indoctrination, the tots and school children are required to visit Uncle, Uncle Ho early and often. We took a bus ride to a river, then took a ferry to Thila Village, where we visited a family that made uh, rice paper. She would put the rice paste on a round flat surface and put a burner down on it for about 10 seconds. Then she would wrap it around a cylinder and transfer it to a basket, uh, then out in the sun to dry. Uh, it looked easy when she did it, but several tried and failed. After that visit, after that visit we went, went down narrow alleys and swore we were lost. Then Henry made a call and suddenly a door opened to a college professor's residence. We went into his home, had tea, and he told us about his life in the village. Near our hotel, we saw a plaque at the lake where Senator John McCain was shot down on a bombing mission to take out a power plant. When he crashed into the lake, he nearly drowned as he had two broken legs because of ejecting out of the aircraft. He was captured and put into the prison camp called Hanoi Hilton for over five years. A little more propaganda. The government said the U.S. serviceman called it Hanoi Hilton because they were treated so well. We took a boat ride to Bat Trang for two home visits. The first was a, a family that did water puppetry, which is a uniquely Vietnamese art form. The workshop shows his puppets, and the man and wife put on a show for us. They're behind the curtain and with poles that uh, operate the puppets. We then visited a family who makes ceramics. We actually tried our hand at making a bowl. The man who put on the demonstration said whoever made the best bowl, he would keep to work for him. <laughs> that one was mine. <laughs> Never a question that I would get to go back to the U.S. <laughs> we had a four-hour bus ride to Haylong Bay where we boarded a junk, sailed in the bay, and spent the night on board. The outcroppings of large limestone rock islands in the bay were the result of volcanoes, 
eons ago. We also explored a cave that is among the wonders of nature, but it was interesting, but no Carlsbad caverns. The dinner on board was quite fancy. This is a photo of some sort of fish in what looks like netting. It was actually made out of a large carrot. The chef showing us how it's done. The time on the boat in the bay was one of the trip uh, highlights. It was peaceful and beautiful, in a stark contrast to the hustle and bustle and noise of Hanoi. After the four hour bus ride back to Hanoi, then an hour and 10 minute uh, flight to Hawaii, our three in country flights were all on Vietnam Airlines, which had a surprisingly modern fleet of aircraft and was usually on time. With our group of mostly 70 plus year olds, it was important that we had plenty of toilet breaks in the schedule. In Vietnam, it was also important that we stop where there were Western style toilets rather than the usual squat style in the rural areas. Fortunately for the females, we always found the Western style. Henry referred to toilets as the happy room. <laughs> On bus rides, he advised us of upcoming happy room stops. He said the women would have western style toilets, but the men would have to go out back and use the happy bush. <laughs> In way, we visited the citadel that housed the imperial capital of Vietnam from 1802 to 1945. We then took a dragon boat ride to a Buddhist monastery for nuns. Uh, for a vegetarian lunch. Uh, there's the modern stove. We were able to ask questions of the nun in the photo, another interesting experience. Later that day, we visited an orphanage that is supported by Grand Circle Foundation, the company that owns overseas adventure travel. There were approximately 120 children at the orphanage, mostly the result of love mistakes, as the abortion laws in Vietnam are very strict. The child grabbed my leg, and one wanted Marsha to hold her. The children seemed happy and well cared for. We asked uh, about adoption, and they said most of the children choose to stay at the orphanage. We took a three-hour bus ride to Da Nang, then to Hoi An. We stopped in Da Nang and walked on a small portion of China Beach. However, since the Vietnam, Vietnamese are at odds with China over the Spratly Islands, it is now known as My Key Beach. I was at China Beach during my tour on a three-day R&R sometime in 1970. We checked in to our hotel at Hoi An, the Silk Village. This was pretty close to being a first-class resort. The Silk Village was, name was apt as they actually grew silkworms. The photo shows them feeding on mulberry leaves. They also weave silk using very old methods and equipment. At dinner time, we enjoyed a cooking demonstration. We learned how to make roll, uh, spring rolls and fish grilled in a banana leaf. The man who put on the demonstration was a comedian of sorts. He was talking about men cooking with hot peppers. He said they should always wash their hands before going to the toilet, otherwise they might damage the population stick. <laughs> Henry was very careful about what he said to us and where he said it, as freedom of speech isn't one of the fundamental rights of the people of Vietnam. 
He found a meeting room at this resort and told us we could ask him anything and he would feel comfortable talking to us. He talked about the greed and corruption among the Communist Party members, which includes the military, police, and city staff. He also told us, if you are suspected of anything, you would be invited for a cup of tea, meaning interrogation at the police station. He had a friend who was a songwriter and wrote a protest song and was actually put in jail for a couple of years. Because Henry's number showed up on the friend's cell phone, he was invited in for a cup of tea. They held him for about 24 hours while they checked his phone and computer and determined he was only an acquaintance. Near our hotel was a stark reminder of the horrific price of war. It was a military cemetery for an estimated 3,500 Viet Cong soldiers. Lest we forget, the North Vietnamese lost over 2 million civilian and military. South Vietnamese lost 245,000. In the U.S., over 58,000. We took a flight from Da Nang to Nha Trang. On the flight, we would have flown over where I was stationed at Phuket Air Force Base. On the way to the hotel, we took a boat ride to see many fish farms. Fish is a major export to other Asian countries, mostly tilapia. Another paradox is the Vietnamese consider themselves to be non-religious. The largest religion in Bo is Buddhism, with 9%, Catholic about 3%, Protestants about 1%, and another 3% of local religions. Even though the country claims not to be religious, they are very devout people. The young people are very devoted to their parents and grandparents. In nearly every private home, there is an altar to worship up to three generations of ancestors. Henry, who claims to be non-religious, prayed for our good health on numerous occasions. There are many beautiful temples, pagodas, and shrines throughout the country. Henry was asked if there were Jews in Vietnam. And he said, sure, it's a tropical country. We have lots of Jews. Pineapple, mango, pie, orange. This day was called a day in the life intended to replicate the daily life of the locals. We started out by climbing on board a motor scooter. Photos of Barbara and Marcia, they're now called Easy Riders. <laughs> we were driven to a village where a family was weaving placemats. And baskets and another family that was making chopsticks, all out of bamboo. We were divided into teams and then taken to a market to get a list of items for lunch. Most of the population shops daily in the markets. The problem was the items were written in Vietnamese. After a lot of wasted motion, we finally found a native who could speak English at the village and, uh, and uh, we found our items. At the village, we're given a tour by the village leader and eight lunch prepared by his wife, purchases at the market. For the run drink, you need to mash some fresh mint, squeeze fresh lime juice, pound some lemongrass, add some sugar, Sprite, and rum. It's quite tasty. This day, we took a four-hour bus ride on terrible roads through what they call the mountains to Dalat. It was at 5,000 feet elevation, something like that. Uh, Dalat is, uh, has some 20,000 greenhouses. After lunch, we went to Dalat University, approximately 8,000 students and learned about the education system in Vietnam. 
After a briefing by a professor, we were paired up with college students for a tour and conversation. The students all had English, but much of their studies involved reading and writing, not speaking. There, were def there was a definite language barrier, but we were able to communicate. This was also another very good experience for us. In the evenings, we were divided. In the evening, we were divided up into three groups, and went to private homes to enjoy conversation and dinner with the families. Our family consisted of a 13-year-old girl. The father was a biology teacher, and her mother was an English teacher. And her aunt to the right was also there to help in the dinner. The daughter, who was delightful, spoke very good English and was the interpreter for the family. Next day, we went on a tour of Delot Agriculture. First stop was a greenhouse where they grew daisies. We were able to pick two each to take with us. We then rode on a trailer or behind an old tractor to a mountain yard village to see them at home and working in the fields. The lot is also known for its coffee. We stopped at a farm where they made weasel coffee. There's another word in there, but I won't say it. <laughs> called Carfo Cut Chong, loosely interpreted to mean civet cat dung coffee. <laughs> the weasels only eat the best and the rip ripest coffee beans. While in the stomach, the beans are coated with a unique enzyme that partially ferments the beans and strips away much of the sharp flavor. After the weasel excretes the beans, they are dried for three days, then given a wine bath, then dried again. According to Google search, in London, the weasel coffee goes for about $600 per pound. Vietnam is the world's second largest exporter of coffee behind Brazil. This is the market in the lot. We had a 4.30 a.m. wake-up call for a flight from the lot to our last stop on the trip, Ho Chi Minh City, formerly known as Saigon. I thought we'd seen everything concerning traffic in Hanoi. But Saigon was what I called Hanoi on steroids. <laughs> Saigon, the largest city in Vietnam, has 10 million people, 7.7 .7 million scooters, and 750,000 cars. The traffic is best described as massive gridlock. In Saigon, we visited the War Remnants Museum, which is a complete makeover of history showing the South Vietnamese and the U.S. as the bad guys and aggressors in the war. It was uh, a little difficult to handle, but they won, and they can tell their story however they want. We then took a bus to the Mekong Delta, which happened to be Henry's home area. We took a sampan ride on a jungle river, We visited a family uh, making coconut candy. It was surprisingly good. Another highlight was stopping at Mytho, Henry's hometown, where his father still lives. We went to his home, and he treated us to some banana whiskey. Henry's father was a captain in South, Viet South Vietnamese Special Forces. After the war, he, along with his fellow soldiers from the South, were taken to a re-education re camp for a couple of years. Additionally, all of his property was taken from him. Photos of his home uh, show another thing common in Vietnam. You see uh, motorcycle, motor scooters here and a bike in the back. They mostly park them inside. Uh, Also, another common thing, as I mentioned, is an altar in the homes. And this one was for of Henry's mother, who died several years ago. Henry's father's a fine gentleman and asked his, to have his picture taken with his brothers in war. Jack, who was in the army near, near the train, 
Um, me. Sobering yet favorite moment for all of us. We then went to Kuchi Tunnels about two hours from Saigon. We took a happy room break, stopped for coffee. Someone had found a happy palm tree. <laughs> Ed took that picture. <laughs> Travelers who stop, have coffee, then a little siesta in the hammock. We were able to go inside the Kuchi tunnels. System was estimated to be about 125 miles of tunnels. Uh, this, we were told, this is a replica, but it's supposed to look like a termite mound. And you see the spot on the, on the mound, that's actually a ventilation pipe that came up and that's how they ventilated the, uh, the tunnels. And uh, like I said, I, I went in one of them and it was a, it's a tight fit. Uh, here is an example of how difficult or how well they hit them. Uh, these are leaves and uh, one of the park people came up. We couldn't tell where he came up. And then he goes back down and the guide says, well, he's going to get up about 15 feet from here. And everybody looked. We couldn't figure it out. And then he comes back up. But the tunnels were a serious weapon for the Viet Cong for many years till we finally figured out uh, what was going on. Our last event was a lunch with a family, and the invited guests were two old Viet Cong soldiers. The highest ranking had been a lieutenant colonel. We had an interesting conversation with them and about, the time, about their time in the military and after. One thing I haven't discussed is the food. But first, the body water in the photo. Another paradox, Vietnam is building mass transit systems in both Hanoi and Saigon, and has millions of tourists every year. It is one of the fastest growing economies of emerging nations but they do not have tap water that is safe to drink. We were told not to drink any and not have ice unless it was an approved restaurant. We drank only bottled water and even then had it to brush our teeth. The locals boil their tap water before drinking or drink purified bulk water. <coughs> I ate everything in front of me and for the most part was very pleasantly surprised. The typical dinner, at least for us, I'm sure it wasn't for everyone, consisted of six to seven courses. This is a typical menu from the Pink Lotus restaurant. Banana flour salad, Hanoi fried spring rolls, grilled mince pork with lot leaves, stir-fried chicken with lemongrass and chili, sauteed, sauteed fish with five spice sauce, stir-fried veggies, steamed rice, and flambe banana. Off to the airport for a flight to Hong Kong. It's Saturday, March 4th. We left at 11.25 a.m., flew to Hong Kong, then on to L.A., and arrived on Saturday about two hours later. Magic. <laughs> about 15 hours in the air and a 15-hour time difference. After experiencing nine flights, two of them butt numbing, for a total of 16,425 air miles, seven different hotel beds, some 50 hours of bus ride, two rides on cyclo rickshaws, a motor scooter ride, taxi rides, French train, jumps, sandman, dragon boat, and a good week of jet lag. All in all, it was a marvelous experience. I would recommend the trip to anyone and also recommend our tour country, company, Overseas Adventure Travel. I will end with a few more iconic images, perhaps more of the paradox enigma. The first is another view of a traditional rice field in the foreground, 
and a modern cityscape in the background. The next is a woman hauling goods in the traditional manner, a modern motor scooter, and a sign advertising cell phones. Finally, perhaps more of the future, a view from the 51st floor of the tallest building in Saigon. As the sun sets on Vietnam, you have to love the people. Our wish for them is continued peace, increased prosperity, and hopefully one day the same basic freedoms we have in this country. Thank you.